Michael Cremo is the author of two best-selling books that challenge the conventional Darwinian theory of human evolution and instead pre presents facts supporting a radical new theory of human evolution. In Forbidden Archaeology, he found extensive evidence that humans first appeared on Earth hundreds of millions of years ago. In his follow-up book, Human Devolution, he asserts that the Vedas contain a vast repository of knowledge that informs us about the forgotten history and true origins of humanity. Today, he discusses how legends of ancient gods creating humans and lost ancient technologies relate to questions of extraterrestrial visitation. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here is Dr. Michael Sala. Welcome, Michael, to Exopolitics Today. Great to be with you. Well, I'd like to begin with uh, your 1993 book, Forbidden Archaeology, The Hidden History of the Human Race. Maybe you can just walk us through what influenced you to write that book? Well, uh, a couple of things. First, uh, the way I was raised, my father was a, a military intelligence officer. And you know, that meant a few things for me as I was growing up. One thing it meant is that I traveled around a lot. Uh, our family lived in different places in the United States and also abroad. In my high school years, I was living in Germany. So that means I got exposed to a lot of different worldviews and ideas. And one of them that really fascinated me was the spiritual tradition of ancient India, which is recorded in the Vedas, as you were mentioning. And uh, another influence from growing up among people involved in intelligence services and things of that sort, is that I became aware at an early age that there are many things that are happening in the world and have happened in the world that don't reach the general public. There, there is hidden knowledge. So one feature of the Vedic tradition and other ancient wisdom traditions is the idea that humans like us have been present for vastly longer periods of time than modern science allows. Today, most scientists would say humans like us first appeared less than 300,000 years ago on this planet. Um, but, you know, I decided to actually start looking into this question uh, of whether what these ancient wisdom traditions have to say about our human history is, is uh, something to be regarded as mythological or is there perhaps some, some factual basis for it? So that's what got me looking into the history of archaeology, going beyond today's textbooks and looking at the original scientific reports. And when I did that, you know, I found many reports of evidence discovered by archaeologists, geologists, paleontologists, showing that there have been discoveries of human bones, human footprints, human artifacts going back very, very far in time, in many cases, many millions of years. And the question kind of arose, well, why isn't it in today's textbooks? So I put together this book with my co-author, Richard Thompson, uh, to, to deal with these questions, to document this evidence and present the, the question, why is it more or less forbidden uh, in the sense that it's not included in today's textbooks? So what are the 
main flaws you found in uh, Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection when it comes to the claim that humans evolved from apes? Well, it, it was very interesting. I, I, I think Darwin had some good insights. You know, I, I, you know, I have to acknowledge that. But uh, as far as his ideas about human origins are concerned, my, my question is, uh, it has to relate to the history of archaeology. Darwin wrote his book, Origin of Species, in 1859. I think it was published. And, and after it was published, scientists in Europe and around the world began speculating about what it meant for human origins, that human beings must have evolved from some ape-like ancestor that existed millions of years ago. So if that were true, then there should be intermediates, missing links, sometimes they're called. So it's interesting, scientists in Europe and other places immediately began searching for evidence of this missing link between ancient apes and monkeys, not exactly today's apes and monkeys, but ancestors of them. They were looking for these missing links, but they weren't finding evidence for a missing link. They were finding evidence that humans like us existed millions and millions of years ago. So those discoveries continued through the 1860s, the 1870s, the 1880s. Then in the 1890s, they finally discovered what they considered to be a missing link. It was Java Man, who was found by a Dutch researcher at a place called Trinil in Java, which is now part of the country of Indonesia. So, that discovery, which was really just a, an ape-like skull and a human-like thigh bone, which he put together and said, this is the missing link that, that we've been looking for. Uh, it turned out to be less than a million years old. So it gradually became accepted in the scientific world, but then they had to decide, well, what are we going to do with all this evidence that uh, has accumulated over the previous decades, they just cast it out. They didn't talk about it anymore. And since that time, they've, uh, <clears throat> whenever anything has been discovered that looks human, but is older than Java man, they interpret it in such a way that it fits the current paradigm. So if, but if you actually look at all the evidence, the picture that emerges is not one of evolution of ancient apes to modern humans, but a picture of coexistence of various hominin types, modern humans coexisting with ape men coexisting with apes and monkeys. And I think that's uh, been true in the past. That's what the actual complete fossil record shows. And I think it's also true in the future. Of course, that takes us into a, another topic, evidence for existing ape men, uh, the Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti evidence tends to support that that even today we're coexisting with various hominin species on this planet and maybe off this planet as well. So uh, that's the kind of picture that emerges and modern science is moving in that direction. They used to think only one hominin species existed at a time. You know, maybe it started with Australopithecus, as you see in the diagram there, and then to Homo habilis and Homo erectus, and then Neanderthals, and then humans 
but now they're finding evidence that we coexisted with other hominin species and even interbred with them. Uh, the human genome contains Neanderthal genes. There's another species they've discovered called the Denisovans, and apparently we also have Denisovan genes in our genetic, in our genome. And uh, so their, their picture of what the actual history of our species is, is becoming more like that, that we suggested in our book, uh, Forbidden Archaeology, that humans like us have coexisted for millions and millions of years with other hominin species and with apes and monkeys. So this raises a very interesting uh, question that if uh, humans coexisted with apes, monkeys going back millions of years, were there more than one species of intelligent human coexisting with one another? I, I think, for example, the discovery of the Boscop skulls in South Africa that, that showed that there was, these, there was a human that had a, a larger brain, brain capacity and than uh, Homo sapiens. So what are the chances that there were multiple types of kind of humans coexisting uh, through going back millions of years? Uh, that's certainly what I've been proposing, that yes, there uh, have always been humans like us. There have always been creatures that resemble humans. You could call them humanoid. And I think that's what the actual evidence suggests. And that's consistent with uh, statements in some of the ancient wisdom traditions, like uh, the Vedic histories, the Puranas, tell us that there are 400,000 human-like species scattered throughout the entire cosmos. So we may not be the only intelligent human-like human species in the universe. Right. Well, one of the things um, that is fascinating is that, uh, I mean, the standard archaeological view, and I think you, you mentioned that, was that uh, humans or variations of humans go back to, I think, what is it, the beginning of the quaternary uh, era, 2.6 million years ago. Uh, but, but you're saying that humans appeared hundreds of millions of years ago. Yes, and I think this depends upon us understanding that the universe has a purpose. It's, we're, we're not accidental creatures in an accidental universe. I think this universe is like, well, it's a virtual reality system ultimately, I believe, but it has as its purpose the, to allow conscious selves, and we're all conscious, nobody can deny that, and modern science has no explanation for how you get consciousness from matter. I mean, they assert a lot of things while it's produced by neurons in the brain, but nobody's ever shown exactly how that could happen. So, uh, I believe that as conscious selves, we're all extraterrestrials in the sense that as conscious individual personal beings, we're not a product of the world of matter. We have another origins on another level of reality where consciousness is dominant not matter. So given that this universe has a purpose, which is to allow conscious selves to 
explore and achieve their full potential as beings of pure consciousness, this purpose is fulfilled in the human form of life. Any species or bodily form is a vehicle for a conscious self, I would say. And the human vehicle is especially important in the sense that it's in the human vehicle that we can inquire about our real nature and decide whether or not to act upon that platform. So I think the human vehicle has always been available for conscious selves in this universe because that's the actual purpose of the universe. Like if we make a space station, send it into outer space, we don't just hope that somehow or other the elements within the space station are going to spontaneously combine and perhaps develop into astronauts, evolve into astronauts. But we send the space station up because we have astronauts that are ready and prepared to use that facility. So I think our universe is like a big spaceship. It has a purpose, a destination. And right from the beginning, there have been conscious selves and human bodily vehicles that have been prepared to use the facility offered by this universe to empower themselves and raise their consciousness to its natural state. Okay, well, we will uh, uh, pursue that line of uh, thought when we uh, touch on human devolution, but just to kind of like continue on this, the forbidden archaeology thread, I, I know in 1996 there was an NBC TV special, uh, The Mysterious Origins of Man, that was hosted by Charlton Heston on your, on your book, on your research. So, you know, what impact did that special have on putting out your ideas of uh, this kind of ancient history of humans going back millions of years? Yeah, well, it, it's interesting how I became involved with that program. When uh, Forbidden Archaeology came out, I sent it out for review to all the major scientific and academic journals that deal with human origins. But I also sent the book to researchers who were doing work in alternative archaeology. And one of them was a, a lady named uh, Jean Hunt, who lived in Louisiana. And she had a, a little organization called the Louisiana Mounds Society. In, in other words, the ancient American Indian people who lived in that area built mounds as part of big uh, city complexes that they had. And she was investigating them. But I spoke to her on the phone once and she told me, I know a television producer in New York City, Bill Cote. He's making a, a documentary on uh, human origins and antiquity. And I think he would be really interested in your book. So uh, I got Bill's contact information from Gene, and I sent him a copy of the book, and he immediately got in touch with me and said he wanted to include some of the cases in this documentary that he was working on for NBC. So... Uh, we did make the documentary. It did feature some of my work, some of Graham Hancock's work, John Anthony West, and others who are involved in alternative archaeology. And we have to keep in mind that at that time, there were very few media channels. Basically, the, the whole 
television net network involved just a few outlets, ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS, and that was it. It wasn't like today. You have hundreds, even thousands of streaming channels and uh, networks that come out through cable and streaming and things like that. So uh, if you had a, a program on prime time on one of these networks, you could reach tens of millions of people all at once. So it was a big shock to the scientific community when on a, a Sunday evening there was on NBC, one of the major television networks, which they thought they completely controlled in terms of their science content. When they put out this documentary, they were outraged. You know, there was outrage from the scientific community. They wanted to boycott NBC. They uh, approached the FTC, I mean the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, to try to get them to fine NBC millions of dollars for having shown the program and force NBC to make primetime apologies for having shown the program and you know to produce uh, a program where you have what they call real scientists presenting uh, a rebuttal of now, none of that happened, I'm happy to say, but it was really interesting that the scientific and academic community responded in that way, which I think they're doing now in regards to uh, Graham Hancock's series that he had out on Netflix, Netflix I believe it was, a uh, similar sort of thing going on today. So for Midden Archaeology, you've, you've found extensive evidence that uh, modern humans, uh, that they physiologically, beings like modern humans, appeared millions of years ago, and that this has been something that the scientific establishment has tried to cover up. Now, I wanted to get your reaction to uh, some of these ancient Sumerian texts, the, the cuneiform texts such as Unuma Elish, that talk about the creation of modern humans by the gods Enki or Enki and Ninhusag, who were acting on the order of, of an assembly of gods, and that, that the creation of modern humans uh, happened 300,000 years ago from these Anunnaki, these extraterrestrials that created, that did these genetic experiments on primitive hominids on Earth, maybe the apes, and upgraded them to create modern humans 300,000 years ago. So how does your theory that modern-looking humans date back millions of years ago, how does that stack up to this Sumerian text saying that modern humans were created 300,000 years ago from genetic experiments created by the Anunnaki? Well, <clears throat> a couple of things. First of all, I think, let's look at the principles involved. Uh, one is that uh, extraterrestrials, perhaps in the guise of gods or goddesses, were having something to do with our presence as human beings on this planet. That is something that I accept. It's totally reasonable uh, because if we actually look at the complexity on the biomolecular level of human beings or any type of organism really, it's very difficult to see how they could have come about by the mechanisms proposed by modern science. There had to be some involvement of beings of, or intelligences of a higher level of expertise in that field. So 
on the general principle that in the our universe is structured in such a way that there are beings with different levels of intelligence that have something to do with the origin of the various vehicles or bodies, uh, different types of plant, animal, insect, human bodies, I think is, is something that I would support. And that is supported by the accounts we find in many of the world's different cultures. Every culture has its cosmology, its account of where everything came from and how it came into being. So uh, the Sumerians have their, their texts have an account that on general principles, if we're talking about the general principles, I accept, yes, there are higher, more intelligent beings who did have something to do with the human origin of the human presence on this planet. Now, I may not agree with their time scale. That's something we, we'd have to discuss. And, <clears throat> but as far as the general principle is concerned, it's something I agree with. So when it comes to the time scale, and you accept the idea that extraterrestrials like the Anunnaki intervened at some point and genetically tinkered with uh, whatever kind of hominids they found there to upgrade them, splicing in their, their genetics, that there, there could have been a series of extraterrestrial interventions over the course of hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Yes, that's a, a, a possibility. But as I was saying, I would not just confine it to the human body, but the whole variety of bodies that are present on this planet. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm not claiming to have a monopoly on truth and Generally, I leave it up to listeners or readers or viewers to make up their minds about what I say. Generally, I present my ideas. I don't try to compare and contrast them with others who are working in alternative history or alternative archaeology. I figure, well, people can make up their minds. But if I'm directly asked about these things, I'm happy to give my point of view for consideration of people who happen to hear it. Okay. Um, well, one of the uh, theories, of course, is that uh, humans are a kind of devolution or in your 2003 book you human devolution a vedic alternative to darwin's theory you you propose quote we did not evolve up from matter instead we devolved or came down from the realm of pure consciousness spirit so can you explain that well yeah there was a question that people asked me after they read you know, forbidden archaeology and say, okay, you've got all this evidence that contradicts the now dominant theories of human origins, you know, the Darwinian evolutionary explanation. So what are you going to put in its place? Where did we come from? And what I proposed in that book is that before we even ask the question, where did human beings come from? We should first of all ask the question, what is a human being? Because we should know what it is we're trying to explain. Otherwise, how do we know if we've explained it or not? So today, many scientists would say that, well, we're just machines made of molecules. That's what we are. 
basically. And as far as consciousness is concerned, well, it's just the result of molecules in the brain area having organized themselves in a sufficiently complex way that consciousness emerges from those chemical combinations, but only temporarily. You know, as soon as uh, the time of death comes and the chemicals in the brain become disorganized, no more consciousness. I, I don't accept that. I think consciousness has its own independent existence apart from matter, apart from the brain, apart from the body. And in the book, Human Devolution, I give evidence that's consistent with that from out-of-body experiences, past life memories, and many other categories of research that show that in addition to the gross physical body made of the chemical elements, there is a subtle mental body with unusual powers. Sometimes people call them paranormal powers like remote viewing, psychokinesis, things of that sort. And then beyond that, there is the conscious self who is making use of the mental and gross physical bodies for its different purposes. So that original conscious individual, that entity is from another level of reality. It hasn't evolved up by combinations of matter. It's come down from some higher realm and has become associated and covered by, associated with and covered by the material elements, the gross and subtle material elements. And it's devolved into that position and the purpose of life is to re-evolve, to attain that original nature. So beings that have devolved in this way from the realms of pure consciousness or spirit into the realm of matter 3D reality, um, and where they are now in a physical body. Now, are we talking about like a number of beings doing that at once and kind of like all spontaneously creating a new race that then kind of interacts and interbreeds with other races of hominids on, on the earth? Is that is that how that would have happened? Well, I have a, a cyclical concept of how this happens. I think it happens repeatedly, you know, because there are you know, if we look at the cosmos on a big scale, we see there are cycles of manifestation and destruction. And you know, we see that on, in our world that there are things that happen in a cyclical way, like the daily cycle, the seasonal cycle. There are cycles that occur regularly in the cosmos and one of them one of the cycles is cyclical devastations that periodically take place on this planet and beyond so uh, at, at certain stages the cosmos is in a dormant state and all the conscious cells within it are like asleep. They're in a dormant condition. Then at a certain point, things are manifest and they take their bodily vehicles and they act in them. Not just in one lifetime, I believe in reincarnation. So there can be an evolution of the conscious self through different kinds of bodies, plant, animal, human, even beyond human, 
superhuman. But no matter what type of vehicle it is, it's temporary. And it's the situation in the cosmos on this level of reality is also temporary in the sense that sometimes things are manifest, sometimes they're not. But there is a level of reality where one does not go through those changes. Uh, one exists in one's real identity permanently. You know, it's like you have an actor who acts different roles in different films and gradually forgets who he really is or who she really is. The actor may then go into analysis to try to figure out who I am, apart from all these different roles that I'm playing. So I think that's what we ultimately all have to discover. And I think that is achieved in the human form of life. So I would say the plan for the human form of life has always been there. There's no origin of it. It's been forever existing. We just have to recognize and realize that. Well, you mentioned the uh, cycles of history, and I know the Greeks talked about their cycles, uh, the, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, Bronze Age, and so forth, and in Hindu or the Vedic tradition talks about similar cycles that, that you, you were alluding to, the uh, the, the uh, Satya Yuga, the uh, Treta Yuga, Dwapa, and the Kali Yuga, different cycles. So, so when you're in this kind of um, high point of the civilization in terms of a cycle is, is that when you have more of this pure spirit manifesting as physical bodies like in a, in a golden age like in this uh, satya era yes and i think this requires that we rethink what we mean by advanced civilization because we tend to think that an advanced civilization is one that has abundant technology, huge achievements in, in that realm, or huge well-functioning bureaucracies that manage everything. But uh, we, we have that kind of society today, but it's not free of many disturbances and difficulties. It may be that an advanced civilization is one that has controlled the level of its technologies, which can be very destructive of the environment and of the living things that populate that environment, including other human beings. We tend to use our technologies to increase our ability to dominate, control, and exploit others, either individually or collectively. So uh, an advanced civilization may not be necessarily be accompanied by what we consider now the signs of, of it, such as elaborate governmental systems, militaries, financial and political institutions and all of that may have been more like simple living, high thinking, you know, it's uh, so that in the Satya Yuga, according to the Vedic cosmology, most people were highly advanced in terms of their consciousness. They were all practitioners of yoga and meditation, living very simply without class divisions. And they were very healthy. They lived long lives and everything was very peaceful and copacetic. So uh, in the next stage, the Treta Yuga, things decline a little bit 
people are still very moral and ethical and inclined towards developing consciousness, but they've divided themselves up into different classes and they've developed urban life and divisions between countries and neighborhoods start to develop. Then in the next yuga, things decline a little bit more and these different divisions begin to conflict with each other. There are wars and things like that that are fought according to certain chivalrous principles. But then in the next age, which is the present age, the Kali Yuga, things really deteriorate and interest in these higher topics practically vanishes and it's predicted to be an age of increasing social and environmental disturbance. But eventually there'll be another Satya Yuga and the cycle goes on and on like the seasonal cycle. I know uh, Western archaeologists tend to focus on the Sumerian texts or the Egyptian texts in terms of like the origins of, of uh, humanity, looking at like the ancient aliens, um, like them intervening in human in humanity's creation. And the Vedas are kind of like forgotten or a poor cousin, you know, really paid attention to. But you, you actually believe that the Vedas are a much more important in understanding humanity's true origins and and this suppressed history so what so why is that what is it about the vedas that you think uh gives us a, a kind of more accurate understanding of uh, humanity's origins well i i think these are individual decisions one has to make and uh i tend to see a common pattern among these different worldviews of different cultures at different points in history. They all tend in one way or another to suggest we're part of a cosmic hierarchy of beings. In other words, there are humans, there are demigods, they may have different names for them. They may call them gene or angels or demigods or uh, there are other words for them in the Sumerian tradition, there are words for them. And above everything, you know, there's this terrestrial level that we inhabit. There's a higher realm of demigods and goddesses and then there's a, a level of pure consciousness or spirit where there's some kind of guiding intelligence. So they all tend to have features like that. They all tend to say in one way or another that the self survives after the death of the physical body. And they all tend to have some system of transmission of wisdom from ancient times to the present. So uh, now if you have anything, you know, if you're in the market for something, whether it's a car or a mobile phone or a worldview, you've got a range of choices to make. So it uh, doesn't mean that the choices that other people make are wrong, but I would say I, in surveying the market, you could say the available cosmologies, the Vedic cosmology, was the one that made most sense to me. And I could tell you the reasons why it made more sense to me. Um, I think before one even starts talking about individual worldviews, 
whether it's the Vedic or the uh, Sumerian or the Mayan or the Incan or Chinese or whatever it is, we should first talk about what we consider would be an ideal, you know, cosmology or worldview. Uh, what features would we like to see in it? And if we can come to some agreement on that, then I think we could talk about individual worldviews to see why, in our view, whatever it happens to be, one is better than another. So it's, uh, I've thought about these things quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> well, I just wanted to, uh, in terms of uh, the Vedas and how they describe this kind of pantheon, an exten extensive collection of gods, demons, demigods, uh, all these different categories of beings, uh, I know conventional archaeologists consider all of that to be uh, mythology. Some might consider those to be like uh, beings from other dimensions. But I wonder whether the ancient aliens thesis makes more sense, that these are actually, or the majority of these beings, uh, somehow connected to visiting extraterrestrials from other solar systems that are arriving here in starships and they decide to colonize or genetically engineered humanity and they have competing experiments, they go to war against one another. Well, what do you think of that kind of idea? Well, I, I think that's definitely part of the story. And if you look carefully into the Vedic accounts, you'll see that they speak of conflict among beings in different parts of the cosmos. Basically, you could say there's a, a division between those who are what we might say on the side, side of darkness and the side of light. You know, in other words, there are certain beings who are into domination, control, exploitation of others. And then there are those who are more in the view that, hey, we're all beings of pure consciousness, let's figure out how to satisfy our material needs in the most simple, natural, efficient, and fair way possible, and let's get along with each other. You know, so you've got those two basic groups in the cosmos, and they see the Earth as a battlefield, you could say. And sometimes one group tries to influence the outcome of actions going on on the earth in opposition to the other group. So you have that kind of level. And they're both visiting the earth in their different forms. Uh, the Vedic tradition, the Puranas, the Mahabharata, and others say that uh, some of the forces of darkness deliberately took birth in uh, families of uh, royal dynasties in order to gain control over the situation on earth and bring it more into their camp. Whereas those in the forces of light, they also appeared on earth and opposed what was going on by the other side. So I think that sort of thing is part of the story. I think people tend to want a, a simple explanation, uh, either a simple, well, everything just evolved from chemicals by natural selection and you know, a simple Darwinian account, or they want a simple creation account. God created everything in seven days or whatever. And some people, they want a simple, what I would call a simple extra, extraterrestrial account. But 
the actual story may be a little more complex. It may be an interweaving of elements from the scientific account, the Darwinian account. It may involve threads from the extraterrestrial account, and it may involve some threads from uh, a, a creator account, you know. So the, the actual story, I believe, involves all of those things. I think there is something to what Darwin said he believed in reproduction with modification. So the reproduction may involve something that goes beyond the kind of reproduction that we're familiar with today. It may have involved, uh, as you've been suggesting, the actions of other beings from either other parts of our cosmos or other dimensions of our cosmos, I would say, that manipulated the reproductive process, you know, genetics, as you called it, uh, in order to be responsible for the production of certain types of beings on this planet. And there may be also an overall controller of everything. You know, so I don't see these things as necessarily conflicting with each other in every way. Maybe they differ in, from each other in some ways, but I think in the synthesis that I'm trying to put together, based on my understandings, you'll find threads of all of these things involved. Well, I want to ask you about the level of technology attained uh, by the ancients as is revealed or discussed in the Vedas. Uh, people had probably heard of the Vimanas. Uh, there's also stories of these flying cities um, in, in the Vedic texts. So, and that's a remarkable thing because, I mean, obviously we haven't yet reached that level of technological sophistication to develop an, uh, a city that levitates, that can carry thousands of people that live and work there. But yet the ancients did and the Vedic texts describe this. So, you know, what has happened to these flying cities? Have they departed? Are they lying hidden? Well, can you talk about that? Yes. Well, one thing to understand is that the Vedic cosmos is a multi-level cosmos. There's a level dominated by the gross material elements that we inhabit. There's a more subtle realm of subtle material, mental, intellectual, egotistical energies that is inhabited by uh, creatures that people call extraterrestrials or angels or gods or goddesses. And then there's the spiritual level, the level of pure consciousness inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. Now, they all have their different technologies, you might call it, their ability to manifest certain things. On our level of reality, if we you know, we, we try to use our intelligence to manipulate the material elements to make whatever technologies we can. And we've developed now some simple spacecraft, aircraft, and things like that. But where did the ancients, as described in the Vedas, get their technologies? It may not have been in the way that we try to manifest our technologies today. As a matter of fact, there's a, an account in the Bhagavad Purana, which is one of the Vedic histories, about how a king on earth, more or less on the dark side, 
got the Vimana, you know, he didn't hire engineers to build it on Earth, but he was able to get it from a higher being, an extraterrestrial being, Maya Donova, who was the engineer of the persons in the cosmos on the side of darkness. So there's a very elaborate description of this Vimana that he got. He used it as a warship to attack a city, Dwarka, that was the capital of the leader of the forces of goodness in the cosmos, Krishna. And he attacked the city with what appear to be energy beam weapons and things like that. But according to the descriptions, this craft was able to appear several places at, the, at once in, in other, to fool the defenders. It kind of resembles modern military technology. If you have an intercontinental ballistic missile that's coming in to deliver weapons, atomic weapons perhaps, to an enemy country, it'll send out, in addition to the real warheads, decoy warheads, you know, to confuse the defenders so they wouldn't know how to uh, attack it, which one's the real, real uh, warheads and which, which are not. So it, it's something described in these ancient texts that we've only recently incorporated into our military technologies. Uh, this, according to the text, this craft had the ability to manifest 3D holographic images of warriors in which they could use to confuse the defenders of the city. So it's really kind of interesting. But the, the question is, where did they get it? They got this technology from extraterrestrials. So this may be a, what's described in these ancient texts may be a reference to some of the first uh, occurrences of extraterrestrial technology transfer. Like, you know, if you go carefully through the UFO literature, you'll see that there are accounts of crashed UFOs that have been kept by government agencies secretly, and they've been able to back engineer some of our current technologies that we use have come from this extraterrestrial source. Like Colonel Corso had a, an interesting book he put out before he died about how he was involved in some of that extraterrestrial technology transfer. And according to him, like our computers, you know, and mobile phones are based on back-engineered technologies from crashed UFOs. Well, you mentioned the city of, of Dwarka and, and Krishna. Now, now Krishna, he is uh, revered in the Hindu world, uh, and he has this coloration of blue. So that's suggested that he may be a member of an extraterrestrial civilization that, that colonized uh, the earth. And uh, with the city of Dwarka, I mean, has it been discovered or does the ruins of Dwarka lie off the coast of uh, modern day India today? It's been supposedly rediscovered. So yeah, can you talk about Krishna being a being, maybe me a member of a race from another solar system that colonized the earth and the city of Dwarka being this coastal city that uh, you know, was part of this incredible Mahabharata war using advanced technologies, but then uh, uh, submerged or was went to the bottom of the ocean. 
Yeah. Well, Krishna is an avatar. That means a personality who descends from a higher level of reality. You know, people have seen the films Avatar. You know, Avatar means one who comes down from a higher level. So he came from the highest level and he did populate the earth with his descendants. Uh, he, he did that, that's part of it. But beyond that, the more deeper understanding is that the reason he had such an interest in what was going on on this planet so that so much interest that he personally descended from his higher realm is that he was in one sense a creator uh, of this whole situation uh, in, in, in other words you're you're right that people have great reverence for Krishna in India and other places too around the world because he, he is regarded as the source of everything that exists. But he takes a personal interest in what's going on. So yes, he did appear and he was defending the city against the city of Dwarka against the attack of this uh, dark side King Shalva, who had gotten this powerful Vimana from some of the darker forces in the cosmos. So eventually Krishna shot down this Vimana. So if one is looking for uh, wreckage of an ancient Vimana, a crashed UFO, the the sea off the coast of Dwarka would be a good place to look. But it's uh, said that at a certain point, uh, Krishna having accomplished what he wanted to do in Dwarka, uh, went back to his original level of reality, which is the topmost level of reality. And at that time, it said the ocean covered the city of Dwarka. So a few years ago, I met an Indian marine archaeologist, Dr. Rao, who was the first to really investigate the seas off the coast of Dwarka. And he did locate the remains of an ancient city uh, that he said was, in his opinion, Krishna's Dwarka. So, yes, there have been remains of the city found. But this kind of, I mean, you find accounts like this in many of the traditions. Uh, I mean, Atlantis being a very famous one. You know, the idea that there was some advanced civilization in a certain place that was later covered by the ocean. So it's a similar account. Now, this is uh, incredible information that can be found in the Vedic texts. And of course, you can go to the Sumerian, the Mayan, the Egyptian, also talking about these ancient gods and long, long lost uh, technologies that were very advanced. Now, you know, none of this is covered in modern day academia. And I know you uh, came up with a, a concept to describe this, which is knowledge filtration. So can you describe how knowledge filtration works to keep the evidence of this kind of like the ancient human origins and all of these advanced uh, technologies that were lost? How does knowledge filtration work to kind of keep all of that away from the public attention? 
Well, we all do knowledge filtering in the sense that we don't necessarily believe everything that comes to our attention, either through the web or social media or whatever. So we all do some knowledge filtering. The problem comes when people apply double standards in their filtering of knowledge. Uh, but that, by that, I mean, you can take a simple example, like a, a policeman, you know, for a, a, a person he likes, they may be going 10 miles over the speed limit. Uh, go ahead. Nothing. But there's someone he doesn't like for some reason because of their race or gender or whatever reason it is. That they're even, you know, just slightly above, you know, maybe one mile above the speed limit. They're stopped, they're harassed, they're maybe arrested. Uh, so it's when people apply a double standard in their knowledge filtering that it becomes a problem. And in forbidden archaeology, we documented this double standard in the treatment of archaeological evidence. You know, evidence that tends to support the current theories is treated very leniently. Anything that contradicts the dominant theories, they uh, subject it to very intense scrutiny. And any little thing that happens to be out of place becomes a reason for totally rejecting it. So uh, we've documented exactly how that happens. So, uh, yeah, for example, in the 19th century, gold was discovered in California and miners went there to get the gold. And Inside the mining tunnels, they were finding human bones, human artifacts. These came to the attention, these discoveries came to the attention of Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. He went out and did his own research, and he concluded these discoveries are genuine. And he published a massive report about them. It came out from Harvard University in the year 1880. Now, these discoveries were made in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are 50 million years old, which is completely uh, out of bounds as far as the scientists were concerned like uh, William Holmes, who was an anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, said about Dr. Whitney's reports, if Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of evolution as we understand it now, he wouldn't have published that report, despite the imposing array of testimony in his favor. In other words, if the evidence doesn't support the dominant theory, then even if it's very good evidence, it's got to be put out. And that's what happened. That's why we don't see these discoveries mentioned in the textbooks anymore. So, and he's directly saying, well, He's got a lot in his favor, but it goes against the theory of evolution. Therefore, he shouldn't have published it. Now, Holmes didn't think that he was suppressing true evidence, which if known would cause people to disbelieve in the theory of evolution. He was just thinking, Something's got to be wrong with this. If I looked hard enough, I'd be able to find it out myself. And it, 
if I can't do that, I'm sure my colleague down the hall could tell me exactly what's wrong with it. it you know, he just thinks he's being a responsible scientist doing his public duty. You know, it, it's kind of subtle how this process works. But whether it's a deliberate conspiracy to suppress truth or a scientist just thinking, well, something's got to be wrong with this. I'll figure it out someday. Either way, we wind up not getting the complete set of facts that we need to make a, a reasoned judgment about these important questions related to human origins and antiquity. So either way, we lose out. So what I often tell uh, scientists is that they should keep the entire set of data that's relevant to their field of study in view. Once I was speaking to some uh, an audience of graduate students of archaeology, geology, and paleontology at the Free University in Amsterdam and the Netherlands. And I told them this, that you keep the entire data set relevant to your field of study in view. At a particular moment in time, something, some particular discovery may not fit. But in the light of future discoveries, something that seemed out of place 10 years ago may now become relevant. You know, so I said, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to you how to divide up your data set. You can say, this part is really convincing. These discoveries, I've got, they're interesting, but I've got less reason to accept them. And these over here, these are totally out of bounds. Okay, make those decisions, but keep the evidence in view. Well, oh, a lot of um, alternative archaeologists, they point to the Smithsonian Institute as playing this very negative role in suppressing the true origins of humanity, um, all of the discoveries of uh, the skeletal remains of giants, which would uh, maybe go to prove uh, humanity's ancient uh, history. So what do you know or what can you say about the Smithsonian Institute's cover-up of this ancient wisdom or discoveries such as uh, giants, skeletons of these giants of many different heights? Yes. Well, I, I do believe that giants did exist. Um I mean, there are many credible reports of discoveries of such things. And, you know, from the standpoint of the Vedic text, they certainly describe that in past ages, people and other living things were bigger than they are today. The difficulty has been for, for me personally anyways, is that I've never been able to personally see and verify the existence of uh, skeletal remains that are clearly of a person beyond normal size. I mean, there are many discoveries uh, related to individuals seven feet tall, but that's I mean, there are Nevada discoveries and, of indicating that and some others. But there are people seven feet tall today. Many of them play on the basketball teams, professional basketball teams in various countries, including our own. But, you know, there's nobody today 10 feet tall or bigger. So that's, that's what I consider to be a giant. Now, 
up to this time, no one has been able to show me some actual physical remains of a being that size. The most convincing report that I've seen comes from a place called Castelnau in France. There, in the early 20th century, I believe it was, a, a, a French archaeologist or anthropologist, a Dr. La Pouge, uh, reported the discovery, not of complete human skeletons, but of human uh, humor eye, humerus is the upper arm bone above the elbow to the shoulder, and human femurs, uh, which is the thigh bone. And archaeologists, if they have a complete thigh bone or humerus, from its measurements, they can tell you how tall the person who had this femur or thigh bone was. And they calculated that the creature, the human that had a femur the size of the one that was found at Castle now would have been 11 feet tall or taller. So there were photographs of those bones published in a scientific journal in France, and it was later also published in scientific journals around the world. So if those bones could be located in a museum somewhere in France, or wherever the bones may have wound up, that may be a, a, a very good case if we're trying to convince uh, the scientific world about the existence of giant humans. I mean, one, one complicating factor is the many uh, photographs that we see circulating on, on the web uh, that are, I mean, they look really interesting. I mean, many, I mean, dozens of people a few years ago were sending me pictures of this giant skeleton lying on the ground with archaeologists standing around it, you know, with shovels and measuring instruments and things. But I noticed in the photograph from the shadows that the skeleton was making on the ground that the sun was coming from a certain position. And the human beings that were standing next to the skeleton should have been casting a shadow on the skeleton, but they weren't. So that kind of indicated to me, and it was later admitted, that this photograph was a Photoshop collage. So you've got that kind of thing that kind of confuses the issue a little bit. But as I said, I, I believe giants did exist, but I think in order to it, you know, it depends who we're trying to convince. Uh, if it's someone who is a scientist or who is very much influenced by modern scientific opinion, I think what we need is some actual uh, specimens of fossil bones that are undoubtedly human, but are of large size, indicating the creature must have been at least nine or 10 feet tall. Yes, a lot of uh, researchers would might reply and say, well, you, you probably would find that in the Smithsonian Institute, but they won't let you in. <laughs> um, but just to finish up, it's been 30 years now since uh, Forbidden Archaeology came out. So do you feel the field has changed? I mean, is there more openness? Is more of the truth out? Are people now appreciating the truth of just how far back uh, humans truly originate and these other elements that we've been discussing? Uh, yes, I think there has been some progress, not 
you know, a completely satisfying amount of progress, but some. When forbidden archaeology first came out, scientists were saying humans like us first appeared 100,000 years ago. In the next decade, in the 2000s, they were saying humans appeared, the first humans like us appeared 200,000 years ago. This year, they're saying 300,000 years. So I see they're taking tiny steps in the direction of forbidden archaeology, but they've got a long way to go. And another thing I noticed is that, and I mentioned this a little earlier in the show, but I think it's worth repeating in answer to your question. When forbidden archaeology first came out, scientists had a very linear picture of human origins with one uh, type of human-like species existing at any particular point in time. And then it would evolve to the next stage and then the next stage. So it was like very linear. Now their conception is more like what we were saying in human about human evolution in forbidden archaeology, namely that the evidence shows coexistence of different hominin types. You know, that was what we suggested then, and science has more or less come around to that point of view, that they now think that a couple of hundred thousand years ago, humans like us were coexisting with Denisovans, with uh, Neanderthals, with Homo erectus, and I think they've added a, a couple of more possible human-like species, like from Indonesia, the hobbit, they call it, Homo floresiensis. And you know, from South Africa, they've got Homo naledi uh, coexisting with humans and other hominins. So I would say there's been progress. Another thing that I've noticed is that in archaeology, you have two groups, basically. I call them the archaeology singular group and the archaeology's plural group. The archaeology's singular group thinks there's one scientific objective, evidence-based archaeology, and whatever we conclude is it, and there's nothing outside that that we're willing to even consider. The archaeologies group understands that their Western scientific so-called objective archaeology was used during the colonial period to suppress the identities and worldviews of people of various cultures in different parts of Asia, Africa, the Americas, and they're willing to consider archaeologies constructed on the basis of these different worldviews. In other words, they're willing to consider an Australian Aboriginal archaeology, uh, a Native American Indian perspective on archaeology, a Vedic perspective. And therefore, I've been able to present papers on my work at mainstream archaeology conferences, mainstream scientific institutions, and mainstream universities, because there's a, a category of archaeologists that may not agree with what I say, but is willing to listen and consider as part of the discourse in their discipline presentations like mine. <clears throat> now, the next step is 
archaeologists who actually accept what I say openly. So they're few in number at this present moment. But I think that's how these things go, if you look at the history of science. So where do people go, Michael, if they want to learn more about your work, if you've got any upcoming lectures, events, webinars, or they want to buy your books? Where do you recommend they go? Well, I recommend that they go to my website, mcremo.com, M-C-R-E-M-O.com. And my books are available there, and we have some special offers. For example, my latest book is called My Science, My Religion. It's a collection of 24 papers that I've presented at mainstream international scientific conferences about various aspects of my work, the forbidden archaeology part of it, the uh, human devolution part of it, which deals with consciousness and uh, cosmological issues. And then we have an offer, if people get a set of my books, which is available for a specific price, then you know that that is, that is available if they you know get a combination of four of my books, uh, they'll get a very special price on that. And for anyone who gets any copy of any of my books, they can also, if they request it, get a copy of Atlantis Rising magazine in which I had a column called The Forbidden Archaeologist. So those offers are available in, in uh, the website. And oh, I should have mentioned that if a person gets my science, my religion, they can also get a free copy of Bhagavad Gita one of the ancient Sanskrit texts that have inspired my my work. So those opportunities are there on the website. The website also has a schedule link, which would inform people of when different talks and podcasts in which I'm being interviewed are going to be airing. And they would also find a link that describes that lists upcoming lectures, public lectures that I'm giving. Well, thank you, Michael, for being on XR Politics today. Well, thank you, Michael, to Michaels. You have been listening to XR Politics today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.